real rock bottom. <laughs> or, as Paul refers to me, Ronco. <laughs> so, I want to get the point across that I was a co-founder myself. Uh, I have co-founded three companies. I'm going to focus on one company right now, and that's Altos Computer. That's a company that I helped co-found in 1979. It was a microcomputer company, and in its day, very disruptive technology. Um, it was a very, very typical startup. The day we started the company, we sat on the floor, because there was only one chair. Uh, we were very, very frugal. Um, for the first two years, I sat next to the copy machine on a little table. Um, we were really, really frugal. Um, we all worked hard, played hard, and that kind of became the culture of Altos. Work hard, produce results, play hard. Uh, we might have been one of the first companies that invented TGI Friday. Uh, the interesting thing is we did it every day. <laughs> our CFO at 5 o'clock would wheel a cart with wine and beer to every desk. We would all drink and fraternize for an hour, and then everyone went back to work. <laughs> uh, and that, that set the culture of the company. Uh, being a typical founder, uh, I worked my tail off. I was the head of sales. I traveled 80% of the time getting orders and pulling the company. We even built our own trade show booths because we couldn't afford the union labor. Uh, and we did this about four trade shows in a row. And then coming to Chicago, which is a huge uh, union town, uh, we came to the show the first day after we set up our own booth. And they had literally blown up the computers. <laughs> so we were busy uh, selling computers in, in the back of one of the co-founders, VW, uh, very beat up VW. I drove a Grand Prix. Uh, it had a very distinctive trait, the sunroof leaked, and one night after going to meetings, I was in the, in the car, in this leaky car, pouring rain, rain falling all over us, literally, um, and, and the co-founder of the company, Dave Jackson, said, someday we're going to take this company public and we're going to drive nice cars. <laughs> well, sure enough, we did go public. Uh, we both bought new cars, but even more satisfying, we had a guy on the factory floor who was a co-founder who, who built the computers. And it was a big deal when we built five a month, but ultimately we ended up building a thousand, two thousand computers a month. And his lifelong dream was to own a Porsche. And he would never, ever buy a Porsche for himself. So when we went public, we bought him a Porsche. We bought him a Porsche, drove it into the back of the factory, and uh, had quite a party. <laughs> uh, but that is that was then, and this is now. I want to describe a little bit about what the investing environment was 30 years ago. Understand, 30 years ago, there were no angels. <coughs> there weren't any super angels either. Whatever, whatever those. Are. <laughs> You literally had to bootstrap your company and have some level of profitability if you were going to get VC funded. So the only funding was on Sand Hill Road. Uh, we were lucky enough to get funded by Sequoia Capital. We had Don Valentine on our board of directors who at the time was the premier figurehead in technology in Silicon Valley. He was one of the founders of National Semiconductor, which is the first place I work. And here's a picture that I took with Don just a few months ago. And uh, that's Don Benson on the left, myself. Mark Pincus, now in 79, he probably wasn't born. Uh, and then you have Carol Bartz, now the CEO of Yahoo, who at the time when we started Altos, was literally a sales rep at Sun Micro. Once again, anybody can do it. So we all have different definitions of success. For me, at Altos, uh, getting out of a flooded car was one. 
<laughs> but more importantly, being able to build and define the culture of the company and achieve sales of over 100 million a year. And in the early 90s, we were the fastest growing company in America. That was more satisfying than getting rich. <laughs> Everyone in this room should understand you can do it too. So let's talk about other entrepreneurs. Uh, and I want you to picture this in your imagination. Uh, at the very top of the internet bubble in 1999, I had a party at my home with 600 guests, tons of entrepreneurs like yourselves and then venture capitalists. We had Warren Buffett as a guest speaker, and we had Dana Carvey as an auctioneer. We did a charity auction where we raised 2.2 million in a half hour. And at this event was Mark Andreessen, you know, all the top VCs, you name them. But also at this party was Larry and Sergey. Google was one year old at the time and this guy called Sean Fanning, the founder of Napster. So guess who you think people gravitated to at this party? Fanning had a crowd around him the whole time. Napster had 40 million users in record time. I always was a big believer in Google. So at this party, I said, I'm gonna go talk to the two wallflowers over there, Larry and Sergey. <laughs> and I went over to Larry and Sergey, and I said, what's up guys? And they go, hey, we're doing great. We're gonna build a big company too. <laughs> <laughs> but we will never be famous like Sean Fanning. <laughs> and I said, I think you're gonna be very wrong someday. And uh, I think history has proven that. <laughs> Sean Fanning built a brand name immediately uh, with Napster, but Napster didn't survive, and Sean Fanning never got financial wealth from Napster as well. But he did build an international brand name for himself and that gave him the credibility to start his second, third, fourth, and now his fifth company. So Sean Fanning took a failure, Napster, but persevered right through it, started Snowcap, and has done several <laughs> other companies since then. And boy, was he a smart guy. At 19 years old, you know, when, when I met him, he was perceptive as ever. Uh, in one of the days that I thought would be the most dramatic of his 19-year-old life, uh, when Napster was taken to court at the Ninth Circuit uh, on Golden Gate Avenue in San Francisco, uh, we lost the first court ruling. And there were literally 50 members of the media, Golden Gate Avenue was closed off with, with media uh, trucks, and they, they had this press conference. And before they started the press conference, and of course, uh, the, with the ego of lawyers, Sean was never even asked to speak at the press conference. I snuck up in the back of Sean and said, are you doing all right? He said, yeah, I'm doing fine. He goes, look at my suit. And I thought, well, what's so special about the suit? Well, number one, I've never worn one. They called me last night and told me I had to wear one. So I borrowed one, and then he says, look down, and literally the pant legs were dragging behind him. <laughs> but he was smart enough to know when Napster got involved with the courts, it was probably all over for Napster. He was already moving ahead in his mind to his next company. There is somebody who's perceptive and thinks about the future. Um, and about a month later, he called me up and said, hey, let's have lunch, uh, and let's have lunch fast. So we run up, I run up, we meet at this restaurant at the airport, and he says, I'm leaving Napster. Now this is when Napster has 60 million users. 
and he says, I want to start this company called Snowcap, the company that became Snowcap, because it will solve the problems that Napster created. And I said, Sean, let's keep that a secret for a while, because Bertelsmann just invested $75 million in Napster, and I think they think that you're staying. <laughs> so he did. But sure enough, he was right. Napster went out of business, and we co-founded Snowcap together. Um, he he had the foresight to to think ahead to to think ahead. Now let's talk about the the start of Google. Uh, I'd like to share how I met Larry and Sergey. Uh, is when the company was called Backrub. They had not given it the name Google yet. I was at a ho holiday party at Vivek Ranadive's house in Atherton and met one of our investors in the, the angel funds at the time, David Sheraton, who works very closely with Andy Bechtelsheim, uh, who spoke earlier. And I said, David, you're an investor in the fund. Show me a good deal. And he said, well, there's this background. Uh, and he, des he described uh, page rank and that the value of the product was relevant. I had just been involved in the IPO of SGs, and the word page rank and relevance resonated, and I bird dog David for a couple of months, and finally he introduced me uh, to Larry and Sergey. Um, Larry and Sergey were very picky and <coughs> discerning. This is when they were raising the VC round, and they said, hey, Ron, if you help us, get Sequoia to invest, because we want to have an OEM partnership with Yahoo, then we'll let you invest. Uh, thank God nobody else knew the Sequoia guys. Sequoia became an investor with KP in Google, and, uh, and off we went. Everyone critiques valuations. The valuation of that round was $75 million pre, and all of us felt lucky to get in it. All of this procrastination and discussion about <clears throat> valuations is completely crazy. I agree with Paul. Companies are binary. They're either big wins or they don't win. Let the market decide the valuation. Uh, and, and the people who invested at 75 million at Google made about $400 for every dollar they put in. So I don't think anybody's complaining. Uh, <clears throat> The other thing that really interested me is that Larry and Sergey came to every one of the monthly CEO summits that we had back in 1999 and 2000. Our fund would sponsor these CEO summits. Larry and Sergey would get there first and be the last to leave. They were just like everybody in this room. They couldn't wait to interact with other entrepreneurs and learn about business partnerships which is something they didn't know about that, that we helped them with. Um, because they were inquisitive, they learned quick and decided that their values would be made, uh, uh, providing a service that made users happy. And if users are happy, you'll build a good brand name. And after you build a good brand name, then you can monetize. That's, that's the recipe for success in, in, in the 1990s and 2000s. Um, when I was trying to get our allocation in Google, uh, and once again, because of SG's success, I knew Google was onto something. And the guy running operations at the time, an unsung hero, uh, he was 21 years old uh, back in 1999, and he, he administered the allocations for the people who got to invest in Google. I made it my business to get to know him and be, become his friend. Uh, his name is Salar Kamandar. And uh, so I went and sat, sat at Salar's desk. There were no offices. And I said, you know, how did you get here? I mean, Salar still looks like he's 18. Um, and he said, well, I dropped out of Stanford Med School. I said, my God, what are your parents saying? He goes, my parents want to kill me. Um, and when I see Salar now, I say, do your parents still want to kill you? Uh, 